a really interesting, probably everyone's interesting today, but this is going to take it to a new level. And I just sort of thought, just as a little, uh, hey, folks, are you going to talk? Go in the back. Mm -hmm. Laura, take mm -hmm. your groupies in the back. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, little Vivi does not have patience for... Uh, how many of you have seen Portlandia? <laughs> okay, you don't know. How many of you have seen Sandy Passage? <laughs> okay, I'm not, I'm not Bill Hader, am I? But <laughs> I tried. We're with Andrew Singer. Andrew uh, is, of course, uh, <laughs> president of Broadway Video Television, executive producer of Portlandia, the awesomes, uh, brothers in Atlanta. Is that right? Brothers in yeah. Atlanta? Yeah, that's uh, coming the Detroiters. out next year. Uh, and I just wanted to start out for a moment. We're going to watch a little video of the montage of some of the things that you have created. But I, I just wanted to get this right. You made more money with Portlandia than NBC did with 30 Rock. Is that an accurate statement? What I'd say is that the, our goal in doing some of these smaller, more curated kind of boutique shows... To make the world shows, a better place? ...was to give the talent the opportunity to have total creative freedom and to not have the pressure of having to appeal to six or seven million viewers... Right. ...by only appealing to or needing to appeal to a million viewers, but having those, that million be extremely engaged, and passionate, and obsessive. And that accidentally turned out to be very profitable? No, what it did was on these smaller emerging platforms, the talent has more leverage. You know, traditional studios and large broadcast networks, the shows get very expensive. The marketing costs are expensive. The contracts with the talent are very expensive. The crew rates are very expensive. On smaller platforms, you have the ability for the talent, everybody involved, including Lorne Michaels, our company, in the case of Portlandia, Fred Armisen, making very little money, actually, on the front end and agreeing to do the show almost on a student film budget, I would say, uh -huh. documentary now as well. But in, in um, kind of an exchange for that, being able to hold on to more of the rights. So rather than relinquishing those rights to a big media company, most of the rights stay with the talent. So if you are successful and the show's on for many years, the talent has a much bigger upside. So before you give away the secret sauce to everyone on how to do this, we <laughs> put together a bit of a montage, a short reel, showing the staggering range of work that Andrew has developed in the past. Uh, this includes uh, talent from Saturday Night Live and, and films like The Awesomes on Hulu, the new Comedy Central show Detroiters, uh, my, my favorite, Sandy Passage, and uh, out of the, uh, the documentary, uh, documentary Now series. So let's watch this real quickly. <laughs> ABC, always being safe. Do you want a man who's on money? Oh, wait for a register. I have to wonder. Just the one time to be that you pay actively? Yeah, I thought it was a free service. It is one time, and then I only say one time to go. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. We are the terrorists. Washington Post. Wall Street Journal. That's right. We did that statement from our phone numbers. I did not like the end of it. Did you read us? I already knew the blend of it. Yes. Did you read it? Yes. Yes. Did you read it? Yes. Did you read that thing that I wrote the sound of the page? Yeah. I did not like the end of it. Thank you. 
That, that's amazing. Now, I'd like to get to the nuts and bolts of the economics of this, because I am intrigued that 30 Rock, which we all know was so successful, somehow, given the way the industry is evolving, uh, you were able to kind of look at this and see a very different set of opportunities. So how does the economics of playing in all these other spaces that NBC wasn't playing in work out? Well, it, every case is slightly different, but I guess, it, you know, kind of what I... After 30 Rock, I said to Lauren that I didn't think that I would be able to deliver another big network show. The talent that comes out of Saturday Night Live tends to be a little bit left of center, more obscure, more avant-garde, and we don't churn out people who create or tend to star in the Friends kind of really popular sitcoms, which are also great, it's just not what we do well. And you told him, you know, it'd be kind of worthless waiting for another Tina Fey. Well, I just said I didn't think waiting for the next Tina Fey was a growth industry. <laughs> and when, um, when Bill Hader and Fred Armisen hear you say that, that you're basically putting them on a <laughs> lower level, how do they take that? Well, you know, what I said to Lauren was kind of that we should stop thinking of the company j as his company. <laughs> not, not, in, not in the economic sense, but How in the sense of rather than it being a thing that only services things he wants to do, because right. what he wants to do is Saturday Night Live and The Tonight Show. Saturday Night Live is the love of his life, mm. and it's incredible. He's still there doing it with absolute passion after 40 years. And I said what we can do with this company is create more of kind of an umbrella platform to service the passion projects for the people from our late night shows, whether they're in front of the camera or behind the camera. And that at the time, in 2003, we weren't in cable, we weren't in digital, we weren't in animation, and I felt that there was a way to take advantage of the emer all these emerging distribution opportunities mm -hmm. and give our cast and our writers and our directors opportunities to pursue their passion projects. And because, and this is, I think, critical, because cable networks and digital networks and short form digital networks don't require the 22 episode building to a hundred episode syndication model. Mm -hmm. A lot of people could do it in their spare time, meaning in the summer. So originally when Fred was on Portlandia, he did that only in the off seasons from Saturday Night Live and he didn't need to leave Saturday Night Live not knowing whether this next thing so was worth leaving for. he could do it on side in his own life. Right. And then once Portlandia, beca it became clear that it was enough of a real thing, that it was solid, that it could become his, the next chapter of his career, then he left Saturday Night Live. But there was three years where he was so, doing so both. So when you're out there and you're kind of looking at this dense jungle of, of po new possibilities outside the networks, you have Amazon, you have Netflix. So how did you get into that and how did you get them bidding against each other? Well, one of the things that was really important to us, um, and it was part of my response to your first question, was retaining the distribution rights. Not necessarily for ourselves, although sure, that's an, you know, we are trying to build a library that we own and control, but equally so for the talent. And uh, you know, traditional networks, they don't do that. They put, you know, a show like any big sitcom, they cost two, three million dollars an episode. And then the networks, at, once you get to syndication, let's say that's 100 episodes. That mm. means if it's two or three million dollars an episode, there are two or three hundred million dollars in debt on the show at the time that they sell it to syndication. They need to recoup that debt. And, you know, they also, all these networks and studios have very funny, sell, you know, favorable to themselves accounting practices. And you see that almost anybody that's created a hit show has to audit the network mm -hmm. and basically threaten litigation before they start being paid. And... On these smaller shows, it's just very clear. You, can, you know, the Louis C.K. model on FX is really what we're doing. I mean, mm. he's doing it as well, where you do these shows really inexpensively. You do them on your own. 
Our company has its own, it's like a little boutique studio. We have our own attorney who negotiates all the deals. It's just one lawyer. It's a small family owned business. We have our own finance division. We kind of do everything in house and we make every decision to try to retain creative and financial control of the project. Um, in do terms you fear of fear becoming a big enterprise because it's so cool staying small? Um, I don't think so. I don't think Lauren really wants to be a big enterprise. I think he wants to always be like the small restaurant. Does he really know what you're doing? <laughs> yes, yes, he definitely does. He definitely does. He doesn't, he's not a micromanager of anyone really, and, uh -huh. but certainly he's you know, passionate about all the projects. I'm sure you met him at our documentary yeah, we were together sure. just, just to, you know, we were, we were together a few months ago in New York, and it was interesting because that, that night when, when we had an interview, Alex Wagner of MSNBC and I uh, had the privilege of interviewing Seth Meyers, Fred Armisen, and Bill Hader, and, and, and uh, one of your writers, and that night, your series, which, had, which was just premiering, had just been renewed. And I'm wondering how you did that, how you got a renewal of a series before anyone in the public had seen it. I would say that we're deliberately, I'm um, deliberately trying to steer things towards emerging platforms where we have more leverage so that for that very reason so like IFC or when we sold the awesomes to Hulu I think it was one of their first original series when you have Lauren Michaels and Bill Hader and Fred Armisen and Seth Meyers and IFC's most successful show is Fred Armisen and Lauren Michaels and my other show Portlandia we have more leverage mm. and so we said to IFC like they loved the cuts of the documentary show as they were coming in and we said look Bill Fred and Seth are extremely busy if you want more of these episodes we, you know, the ratings on IFC and ratings in general are less relevant. You know, I think 88% of Portlandia's audience watches it not on linear television. They watch it in aggregate between Hulu, iTunes, um, especially Netflix in that case, and then BitTorrent other ways illegally. And so why wait for the television ratings, you know, over the first couple weeks on a small cable channel? You know you like the show. You know you believe in the talent. Let's figure out a schedule where they can do more of these episodes. A place like NBC or CBS, I doubt, would be able to do that. I think the real estate on those networks is so valuable that they need that research corroborated before they can take any further financial risk. Um, it's something we were talking about last night at the dinner that uh, The Atlantic hosted with some of the speakers, where you know, I really also think talent really wants to find a home where they're comfortable. It's not just about the economics. Fred had a very good experience at IFC. He liked, you know, at IFC, they did things a little bit more experimentally. When we launched each season of Portlandia, the network actually turns over the marketing of the show to an artist each year. Wow. That they mutually select with Fred and Carrie and John Kreisel. This year it's Tina Barney, who's doing all the billboards, all the photography, all the graphic design, and they, allow just a, a different experience for the talent and I think that the talent still wants to have a great experience. At the end of the day when you're doing a show there is a patron whether it's IFC or Hulu or Amazon whatever the emerging platform there's somebody who's giving you the money to do it and usually you have to spend a lot of time with that person over the course of the many years that you're producing mm -hmm. that television show and I think that relationship is as critical and in, in our case I would say even more critical than the economics. I mean, after just spending a few minutes with you, I'm, I'm really interested in your ambition. And, and, and when you unpack ambition, <laughs> and with many, many people I see as ambition, they often target a foe or an adversary or someone they want to beat. And is that person Reed Hastings? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think for us it is. You know, from, from, for a company like ours, which is really about the talent and the content, I, I think we take the philosophy that there's always going to be a different set of pipes, right? Right now, Netflix has an incredible platform. But if you sell to Netflix, as I understand it, so an artist or director or producer, you get paid once, and the Netflix has you. And, they, and one of the complaints about Netflix is that it's so dominant now that, that artists don't get it. So you can have something enormously successful, and it doesn't matter. You don't get any Netflix. That, so I guess my question yeah. is... Will somebody take down Netflix? Can Netflix continue to be Netflix as art and talent become more powerful? I mean, I, th I definitely think Netflix is legit and they're here and they're serious. Uh, and they're doing They're probably great, in the room right they're now. They're doing great stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I, I would still, under certain circumstances, want to have a show on Netflix. In the case of that documentary show, 
Netflix very much wanted that show because huh. both comedy, including Portlandia, and documentaries perform incredibly well on Netflix. And part of the reason we didn't go there, and, and the guys and the, could have made a lot more money up front, mm. and the budgets of the show would have been probably three times as high, but it was more important to us to own and control our own content, and it was more important to those guys to if we create something that's successful and build a library that they can determine how it's distributed mm -hmm. um, in a more fluid way. So in, in that instance, we didn't pursue it. But I would say that for us, I feel like there'll be a different, who knows five years from now and 50 years from now, who's going to be sending content mm -hmm. in the best, most compelling, efficient way and marketing that content. We don't know. And it's not our expertise. So we don't want to be Netflix. In fact, it's mm. kind of the contrary. We're absolving ourselves of that entire problem. There are other very smart engineers who will, and, and you know, entrepreneurs who will develop emerging platforms. And I'm sure there'll always be an evolution of ones that are the most dominant, and then some will fail. There'll be some that stick around longer than others. I think there are some media, big media companies like Disney or Comcast mm -hmm. that are certainly here to stay, and they'll fluidly change their business model mm -hmm. as customers demand. Um, but for us, we're just trying to keep making cool stuff. If we own that cool right. stuff, there'll always be a new, better set of pipes that will want that cool stuff. So we have three minutes. We've got to get a question in. But I also want to hear about this heroin researcher that you guys found <laughs> off of YouTube who was doing flash videos of dinosaurs in Waco, Texas. So <laughs> what's that story? So we started a YouTube channel called Above Average, which, is, um, which we financed independently of any studio. It's, um, it's kind of like a, it's less dominant, but it's not dissimilar to Funny or Die, except that there's no user-generated content. It's all professional, right. you know, produced comedy. And um, one of the young staff members found a cartoon, very simple, flash cartoon that was on a Tumblr page of someone who was conducting heroin research, uh, in create, a scientist who was creating a drug to help curb heroin addiction at Columbia Presbyterian Give us in New York. Form. And um, we found this cartoon and we put it, we invested in it, just not a lot of money. Our web series, are, I don't know what the budgets are, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, uh, kind of helped get it to another level of production value. And when Seth Meyers was staffing writers on The Awesomes, which is our original series for Hulu, which he created, I said to Seth, hey, check out this cool cartoon that this scientist at a heroin lab in New York has been producing. Rather than just looking at writers from creative artists agency, William Morris right. Endeavor, the traditional ways in which producers get submissions for writers, right. he looked at it, he met him, he liked him, he hired him on The Awesomes, the relationship grew, and he now has hired him as one of his head writers on Late Night with Seth Meyers. So now he's a writer on The Awesomes. He's a writer on our Late Night show. And actually, Comedy Central approached us, having seen the cartoon on Above Average, to adapt it as a pilot script. He wrote the script. We've now produced the pilot. And it could very well go to series. I'm not yet sure. But I do think it's a good... And, and, and what is your impact on the state of heroin addiction <laughs> research in America? I think it's a very good narrative for someone being able to put something out in the world using what's now relatively inexpensive technology and having it be discovered and, and, and develop a career from that in kind of a way that wasn't possible, you know, even five years ago, I don't think. Let me get at least one quick question. We've got one over here. Yes. Hi. Hi there. My name is Elizabeth O'Connor, and I was an economist at the Capital Group for 15 years, and now okay. I have my own company. Um, so I study the heck out of economics around a lot of different industries, and I'm intrigued by this one. What if Netflix figures out the back-end revenue share with talent model, then how does your world change? Can you coexist? Does it help your model? Yeah, I think it would. I think if Netflix would start giving talent back-end, and I think they very well may have to, I think if Hulu and Amazon and new competitors develop platforms that are as compelling and, and eat into Netflix market share when they're having to compete with the talent, or for the talent, rather. I think they very well may have to give up some of that back end. I'm certainly hoping that the market kind of levels out in the talent's favor rather than in just the distributor's favor. Then, yeah, I think there will be an incredibly compelling platform. I'll say that when we're meeting with writers and directors now and setting pitches, Amazon, Hulu, and Netflix come up as seamlessly as HBO, Showtime, NBC, anywhere else. It's, it's not like they're this other thing. It's, they're just as much the thing as anything. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Singer.
Broadway television. Thank you so much for showing us how, how you got to do it in the new world. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Great.